A very good morning to you all and a very happy spring day from warm South Africa. And welcome to our seventh of an eight part seminar series for those participating for the very first time. This is our penultimate session before our think tank conference to be held in Addis Ababa on the 3rd to the 5th of October on the theme African Futures and the focus will be on Africa's development prospects in terms of the Agenda 2063 vision. My name is Pamela Gopal, the lead coordinator of the policy bridge tank program at the African Union Development Agency, NEPAD. This seminar is co-hosted by AUDA NEPAD and the Institute for Security Studies, ISS. Um, today we'll be uh, discussing on the topic, how could better governance improve development outcomes? The AUDA NEPAD Policy Bridge Tank Program, it seeks to actively engage and leverage the knowledge content generated by think tanks to identify and address continental and regional challenges through evidence-based policy and knowledge services. The program also aims uh, to help translate research output and connect knowledge to decision-making platforms to build a strong and interlinked African-driven science, uh, research and a policy space. To remain content relevant and harness world-class research, and problem solving policy analysis and foresight capacity on Agenda 2063 implementation. We have partnered with the African Futures and Innovations Program of the Institute of Security Studies, who are the specialists in providing meaningful contributions through Africa's broader economic transformation in order to support national and regional development plans and processes. The African Futures and Innovations Program brings foresight analysis to integrate the international futures modeling platform and serves to analyze complex and long-term dynamics of change in human, social, and natural systems. Our aim today is to share resources and knowledge content to improve the way we contemplate and plan for the global future. We are delighted that you are joining us today and we look forward to this fruitful and engaging dialogue. And we will be uh, joined today by a presentation by Dr. Jackie Silias and two of our eminent discussants. With this, I wish to introduce to you Dr. Jackie Silias, who is the founder and former executive director of ISS. He currently serves as a chair of the ISS Board of Trustees and head the African Futures and Innovations Program at the Pretoria office. Jackie has authored several books with addresses, uh, which addresses South Africa's future from politics, economics, and social perspectives, as well as on topics of the future of African challenges and opportunities through a rigorous look at the continent as a whole. So with this, Jackie, welcome, and I hand over the floor to you now. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Pamela, and uh, always a pleasure to uh, partner with NEPAD uh, on our long-term forecasting work. So, um, Pamela, I'm going to share screen and then um, uh, take us through there. Um, so, what I'm doing is I am showing the front page of the African Futures um, website. Uh, one of my colleagues will share the address of the website in the uh, chat function. Everything I'm going to uh, show you and going to speak about is on the website, and I'm going to guide you on where to find what I'm speaking about. This is the front page, and on the left, uh, there is a um, what they refer as a hamburger menu where you can click. I want to uh, go to the about section of the website and just give an idea of what we've done on this website. Um, so the website models potential progress towards the Africa Union's Agenda 2063 vision through the individual and combined impact of various scenarios on the future of Africa. It's five regions such as North Africa, eight regional economic communities such as ECOWAS, country income groups such as, such as the average for Africa's low income countries and individual countries. The forecast horizon is to the end of the third 10-year implementation plan of Agenda 2063 
in 2043. So this is what the site does. There are more than 4,000 charts on the site and it was launched last year, um, in June of last year by the NEPAD CEO in the presence of uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa. Uh, to give you an idea of what we've done on the site, I'm going to go to one page on the site um, and uh, give you an idea of the sort of structure of, uh, of the, of, uh, the forecasting. Uh, let me just make this, oops, a little bit smaller. Uh, ah. Okay, so what we do for every African country is we look at where the country is headed on its current development trajectory out till 2043. Then for every individual African country, we model a single aggressive positive scenario that is benchmarked with the best achievable by uh, countries at similar levels of development. We do that for every of Africa's 54 countries, and we then aggregate that into groups such as ECOWAS. So we look at uh, the positive impact of inward financial flows. Uh, we look at the impact of the full implementation of the African continental free trade area. We look at the impact of a manufacturing uh, transition on Africa's development prospects. We look at an agricultural scenario and what that could do for Africa. We talk a lot about agriculture in Africa, but Africa has never had an agricultural revolution. We look at the impact of infrastructure and leapfrogging. We combine the two in a single aggressive scenario. Um, we look at the impact of better, uh, more, and appropriate education for Africa at every level of education and what uh, th that impact could be. We look at uh, Africa getting more rapidly to its demographic dividend and improved health. Africa only gets to its demographic dividend uh, in the second half of the century. And then we look at the impact of uh, improvements in governance. And eventually, which is what I'm going to speak about today, eventually we combine all of these in a combined agenda 2063 scenario. And remember our forecast horizon is 2043. Um, so that's what we do on the site. And there's a lot of data and there's also a few other things that I'm not going to go into on the site. Um, but um, if I were to uh, go to the um, front page of the site, uh, again, there you can see the uh, countries, you can click on any country and you can interrogate that country's current path or it is its long-term uh, impact of any of those uh, scenarios that I've mentioned. And to do that, you click on themes and there are the various themes. So we are, I am today going to present to you the impact of better governance on Africa. Now, what is very important is that we compare the impact, for example, of better governance with all the other scenarios or themes that I've shown here. Um, and then look at their combined impact globally. So let's go to better governance or improved governance and the impact of governance. Um, all the, the pages on the site all more or less look the same. There is at the top, what we refer to as a slider. And then on the left-hand side, there is a content menu. I'm going to talk our way through the governance slider. It says top 10 takeaways. And I'm going to speak a little bit about what those top 10 takeaways are. I'm going to, the first sort of takeaway is just to stop for a moment and speak a little bit about uh, history and legacy because it's very important. So the historical process of state formation, um, this is particularly pertinent to the so-called Westphalian uh, a process of state formation after the Treaty of Westphalia of about 1644 consists of the sequential pursuit of territorial security, building capacity and expanding uh, inclusion. And I'm going to say something about that, but instead of this inward outward process where nationalism preceded development, the African state, as we all know, is an external colonial imposition. African states effectively gained sovereignty when the, the Cold War ended in 1989. And let me explain that. And let me, and when we look, when we look at that very simple two sentences, history is important. And uh, Africa followed a somewhat different and a unique um, development pathway. As we know, we are all African. Humanity comes from Africa. 
It's just a matter of time. Homo sapiens left Africa and then multiplied and through uh, population pressure, war and development developed. And they multiplied in their millions outside of Africa, but not inside Africa. Because inside Africa, Homo sapiens who had um, lived in much closer proximity to nature had a much higher disease burden. And that explains the low population density, the less competitive pressures for development, and also why Africans who lived in vast expanses across the continent uh, didn't develop the technology that developed outside of Africa. Geography, disease burden um, determined our future. And it's the reason why African empires could not resist external intervention and were dismantled by external intervention. And then um, beyond that, in re uh, a few centuries ago, um, uh, slavery um, uh, basically denuded Africa of its productive manpower. Then came imperialism and colonialism, which was relatively short in historical context. But all of these processes disrupted the uh, natural state formation process. This process of building security, building capacity, and expanding inclusion never occurred in Africa. Although colonialism lasted a relatively short period until 1960, it was held intact. The, pre, the colonial um, state uh, imposed state by the scaffolding of the bipolar Cold War, which really stripped African countries uh, of agency until the Berlin Wall collapsed. And therefore, in really, that's why um, this statement makes the point that African states effectively gained sovereignty when the Cold War ended, because the Cold War stripped, um, uh, uh, ended the end of the Cold War ended the, the scaffolding that kept the African state in its, uh, literally in its colonial uh, framing. And then after 1989, you had very rapid democratization of Africa, what some refer to as the third wave, Huntington referred to this as the third wave of democratization. And in actual fact, a brief period of African agency emerged. And if you look at recent uh, conflict trends, then the period 2004 to 2006 were the most peaceful in modern African history, because they were, we, we didn't have uh, the former uh, Soviet Union and the, the West competing and in actual fact, driving conflict uh, in the continent. But because the African state is an external imposition, uh, borders were not determined by Africans, but by, by others, uh, nationalism never preceded development, and African leaders often have a family, a tribe, or an ethnic, or ethnic orientation, and not a national developmental orientation. So 63 years since independence, uh, has been uh, 63 years have passed since independence, but the delayed and incomplete state formation process lies at the root of Africa's governance challenge. So this is a diagram of the Westphalian state formation process that I spoke about. You built security um, through the consolidation of territorial governance authority through coercive coercion, co-option, and legitimacy. Uh, kings, or what we today would call warlords in Europe, did that very effectively. Then you built capacity through a professional civil service, effective tax, taxation and revenue collection, the rule of law and provision of public safety. But as that happened, um, the subjects um, demanded more representativity and inclusion. And that became characterized in the modern world by a free flow of information, freedom of association, extensive participation in political decision making, and a cooperative culture of political behavior. So this is what happened. This is the Westphalian process that I've just referred to. But if we now go back to the history that I summarized, this is what happens, what is happening in Africa. We have to build security, capacity, and inclusion simultaneously, uh, whilst our freedom of action is constrained by a rules-based international order, and the nature of the international system is determined by the liberal international order. Um, and that parallel process of uh, pursuit of security capacity and inclusion comes with it uh, with significant amounts of, of challenges. So as a result, 
Africa has poorer or less governance when compared to the average for the rest of the world. We have built an index I'm going to speak about, but many African states have fragile security foundations and capacity cannot be built without a secure and stable foundation. And more inclusion only marginally compensates for a lack of security and capacity. So the key question really is this last one. Does more inclusion, in other words, more democracy, uh, gender representativity, uh, representation of uh, minorities, compensate for a lack of capacity or a lack of security? It's a, it's a fundamental question. I think only to a limited extent. Um, I ask that question because many African partners in the West often insist that Africa should be more democratic but they are reluctant to build the capacity and the security that is foundational for um, that um, democracy to sustain itself. Now, th there's no doubt that democracy delivers development, but it only does so over long time horizons, um, since it is dependent upon institution building. Democracy is an expensive exercise. In the short to medium term, the development orientation of the governing elite is more important, and I'll return to that. So if we use an index that measures those three dimensions of uh, security capacity and inclusion, and we compare the averages in Africa to the rest of the world, Africa has about 15% less security, about 38% less capacity, although North Africa has much more capacity than Sub-Saharan Africa, and about 18% less inclusion, although Sub-Saharan Africa does better on inclusion than North Africa. At low levels of development, the state's role is key, but the ratio of government expenditure uh, to GDP, to gross domestic product in Sub-Saharan Africa is 22%, which is the lowest of all regions globally. The average for the rest of the world is 35%. Now there's a, a law um, uh, known as Wagner's law, that says that government expenditure as a percent of GDP increases as countries develop. Or to put this differently, low levels of government expenditure to GDP reflect low levels of state capacity. So if you look at the results by an organization like Afrobarometer, it tells you that the quality of governance, and by the way, the World Bank uh, development indicators, the quality of governance in Africa has remained unchanged over the last decade, reflecting slow economic growth and modest improvements in average incomes. And in our view, only more rapid and inclusive economic development will change this. Technically, what poor, Afri poor African countries don't need a democratic state but one where the political and bureaucratic elite has the genuine determination and autonomous capacity to define, pursue, and implement development goals. Of course, in the long term, democracy offers the most promise. It's the best way of maintaining that. If you are lucky enough to have a developmentally orientated dictator, that's great, but that happens very seldom. So on this website, in this particular theme, we model the impact of better governance on development outcomes. Now, it's one of a number of scenarios that we develop. This is a framework uh, of, the, of the levers that we pull in the international futures forecasting platform that we use. And there is detail about ifs, as we know it, international futures, in the about section on the website. If you go there um, and you click on about, you will find a significant amount of, of information uh, on the um, uh, forecasting platform, the modeling, and how we have done this. And there's, uh, it's quite a complicated process. Let's start on the right-hand side. We want to look at how to affect better governance. We do that by uh, more stability, more capacity, and more inclusion. Uh, this is the levers that we pull in the data within IFS. We, pu we pull these levers at a country level. We look at uh, improving capacity. Um, by improving the quality of governance, reducing corruption and making it more effective. And then we, we model a more inclusion through more democracy, more economic freedom and gender empowerment. This is the framing of the scenario that we've done. Um, and I've said where to find um, uh, detail on the model. If we do that, 
By 2043, better governance on its own can contribute about 9% uh, to the size of the African economy. In other words, it improves by about $748 billion by 2043, above our forecast of what it would be in 2043. About 37 million uh, fewer extremely poor Africans uh, would, uh, th that is the result. And GDP per capita would be about 6% higher. So that's the impact of that scenario. Practically, effective governance requires a broad tax base, the means to provide security and legitimacy. And um, we, of course, look at recommendations and, and particularly look at countries, mostly in the West, that try and help Africa through aid. And we make the point that foreign aid partly compensates for low levels of revenue uh, collection, but undermines the social contract. And a lot has been written about this, uh, books like Dead Aid and so on. Um, to avoid the associated adverse effects, uh, aid should be tied to clear outcomes and include support to provide security. So I think other than most, than most others, we argue that aid should be conditional on outcomes. Fairly controversial position, I should add. Um, and in our recommendations uh, to partners from the West, we argue, and this is why um, uh, Chris Modeling is also here, is that Western donors should resist the temptation to demand that Africans adhere to human rights standards possible in high income countries. Because in our view, democracy is a relative concept. We need to focus on good governance and fair elections. Of course, there's a huge overlap between uh, good governance and democracy. Um, and the relationship between democracy and growth is contested. It's clear at high levels of development where uh, uh, there is a, a clear causal relationship between uh, democracy and growth. But at low levels of development, it's much more uh, debatable because uh, at low levels of development, democracy is procedural and only makes a limited contribution to growth. And even in fragile settings, let's just say, say in South Sudan or Somalia or post-conflict societies, democracy may actually undo much of the progress made in ending the conflict, given the fact that democracy introduces political contestation uh, along ethnic uh, and other lines. Democracy only impacts positively on governance and development if it is substantive. And substantive democracy requires minimum levels of stability, and capacity, which is largely absent in Africa's 23 low and 23 low middle income countries. So I have um, scrolled through um, the work that we have done. Our, uh, these are the people that fund our work and we have a, a large partnership with Order NEPAD with Pamela and colleagues. And now I want to go to the, uh, to the website. Um, and I'm going to click on the contents button on the, on the left-hand side. Um, here, and this is the same for every of the themes on this website. Now, I have um, spoken a little bit on the conceptualizing governance. I have spoken about uh, governance and its historical uh, development in Africa, the beginnings, the impact of slavery, colonialism, the Cold War, the advent of democracy globally, the focus uh, amongst donors on democracy, and the impact uh, in Africa that instead of the Westphalian sequential process of building stability, capacity, and inclusion, Africa has to under undergo the simultaneous uh, transition and, that, and the absence of a consolidated state that where nationalism preceded the state really lies at the root of many of Africa's challenges today. It lies at the root of the instability we see, for example, in the Sahel, West Africa, and so on. Then in the rest of the theme, we unpack each of these. We first look at security and governance, and then we look at conflict trends, terrorism, protests, and riots. Then we look at government capacity, and we look, um, spoke a little bit about that, how important that is. Then we speak of inclusion, and we look at various data sets, such as that is VDEM, polity, um, uh, international idea, to look at, at measures of democracy uh, in Africa. We look at the um, state of governance in Africa. We model the scenario and we conclude and we show the impact. Another way to look at the data that is on the site is to click here where it says all charts for the theme, where it lists all the charts. We are, we are data people, so we, we like charts. 
So I'm first going to go to um, uh, chart 15. Um, and just to show you some of the comparisons that you can do on the website, everything that I'm showing you is on the website. So at the moment, what this shows you um, is it shows you the, uh, um, th there's an index for, um, for uh, uh, security capacity and inclusion. This is the average for um, the world except Africa, which gets about 0 0.79 on the index on security. Whereas North Africa gets zero, North Africa has less security than the average for the rest of the world. And Sub-Saharan Africa has even less security than the average for the rest of the world. Then um, if we look at uh, the measure of inclusion, you can, one can see that the rest of the world in actual fact is much more democratic or much more inclusive than North Africa, which is less inclusive than Sub-Saharan Africa. There are big differences between North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. Africa is one continent, but from a developmental perspective, huge differences. And look at the issue of capacity. North Africa does well on capacity and Sub-Saharan Africa really does very poorly. And you can look at these dimensions for every African country or for every region globally. So that shows us, it's a sort of a summary of the, of the of the current path where we think Africa is headed. I showed you uh, previously um, this chart where I showed you uh, how we modeled um, uh, governance and how we forecast governance using the International Futures Forecasting Platform. Remember the previous slide um, where I looked at security capacity and inclusion was the current path where, we, where Africa is at the moment. And now when we forecast governance, we build the structure and we forecast this at, uh, at a country level. So what is the impact of our scenarios? For this, I'm going to go to uh, chart 20. And here what we show for every African country is we show GDP, the improvement in GDP per capita. Make this a little bit smaller. We show the improvement in GDP per capita for each African country in the governance scenario. So this is, sorry, let me just scroll up a little bit. This is the percent change. Um, and the, the bars that are highlighted in this instance is low income. There are 23 low income countries. Let me make this a little bit smaller. Um, so by 24 or in 2043, um, Somalia, Central African Republic, these are uh, um, uh, low income countries will have that percentage increase in GDP per capita compared to their current path. This is a for each African country and the um, uh, highlighted bars are the low income countries. And if I change this, uh, I can also highlight, let's say the low middle income countries. Um, and I can also look not only at the percent change in GDP per capita, but the absolute change. So what would be the GDP per capita that a country would gain from improvements in governance? And here you can see Libya would uh, get over $3,000 um, 2017, constant dollars in 2043 improvement on uh, its uh, GDP, on its current path GDP per capita forecast in 2043. And you can look at every African country. So this is one measure of the impact of our governance scenario on GDP per capita. The other measure that we typically use would be to look at uh, the impact of uh, on extreme poverty. And here I'll go uh, <clears throat> to chart 21. And that shows you the reduction in the number of uh, extremely poor Africans in each uh, country if we implement the governance scenario. This is highlighting again, low income countries, Somalia, um, Algeria, uh, Egypt, um, Ethiopia, and so on. Of course, these countries, uh, particularly Egypt and Algeria, already actually are very, have very low uh, extreme poverty rates, but this shows percent change. If I were to change this in absolute change, of course, Nigeria, I think, would be the country that does the, does the, the best. Um, yes, uh, more than 12, almost 13 million less Africans living in extreme poverty in Nigeria in 2043 compared to the current path forecast 
followed by the DRC. Now, it's not surprising that these two do the best because they also have the largest number of extremely poor people. In actual fact, I think uh, next year or this year, Nigeria has got more extremely poor people than India, and it, it has effectively become the world's poverty capital. Um, and this is the um, uh, absolute change for every African country uh, to the right-hand side. So this, in summary, is our main findings. I'll just go to the uh, sort of key recommendations at a very high level. The African state is an external position and struggling to simultaneously become more stable, get more capacity and become more inclusive. And the quality of governance has only improved very slowly. Most African states have low levels of stability, need to improve capacity, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, and must become more inclusive, particularly North Africa. While armed violence may decline over time, uh, riots and protests are likely to increase, largely because of democratization and the impact of that, requiring appropriate interventions and expenditure. Africa must tackle the problem of new patrimonialism, corruption, state corruption, uh, elite club corruption, possibly through increased efforts of decentralization of authority to metropoles that are capable of managing themselves and so on. Foreign aid must be tied to clear outcomes to avoid adver adverse effects, and Western donors must focus on good governance and fair elections, not currently unattainable human rights standards. Of course, very controversial what I'm, what I'm saying there. So um, these are our, um, uh, our, uh, the um, findings on, on our website. Uh, the website is a, uh, is a massive undertaking. Um, and um, I think that our argument is that um, governance is, of course, critical to the future of Africa. Um, and what we've done is we've not only we've shown the impact of a series on this website, we show the impact of a series of scenarios on Africa. We look at where the Africa is going on its current path. We look at these various scenarios. We combine them in a combined agenda 2063 scenario. Uh, we look at the impact of all of these on work and jobs, on employment, on climate change and the energy transition. And we also look at the impact of global developments on the future of Africa. So um, Pamela, I'm going to stop there. I've probably spoken far too long, but um, hopefully this gives an idea of how we have modeled governance and where governance fits into a, a broad systemic view of the long-term future of Africa. And thank you very much for, for listening to me. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Jackie, for that. I mean, it was clear, uh, you know, in the graphs that you have presented, um, you know, how the worsening security situations mirrors growing discontent with governments if they're, you know, unable to effectively serve their citizens, uh, etc., and how this is modeled. But more importantly, you know, as, a, um, as long as governance is not improved substantively, I think uh, development across all sectors then will be negatively impacted. So thank you very, very much for that. I have seen some questions and I just want to encourage the participants to please continue. We will address all the questions once we have heard from our discussants who will now respond to Jackie's presentation. With this, I would like to in, um, introduce to you our next discussant, which is uh, Mr. Chris Murleng. Uh, Chris is an international chief executive officer and currently at the SADC uh, Executive Director of Good Governance for Africa. He's an accomplished public and corporate affairs practitioner with close to 20 years working experience specializing in strategy, research, media, communications, security, corporate governance, and public affairs. Uh, prior to this, Chris has been appointed as Chief Operations Officer for the South African Broadcasting Corporation known as the, you know, we know it as SABC. And Chris has spent many years in the media and communication space by enforcing governance and driving efficiencies within the operations cluster. And more importantly, from the, the media space, Chris has spent over six years at E! News Channel Africa, uh, ENCA, where he was Africa editor and head of the department of the Africa division. So Chris, welcome again. Thank you for your time and over to you. You on mute, Chris. You on mute. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry, well, we, I, we, we should know how to operate the mute button by now after all of these Zoom meetings that we've been having during COVID. But 
Um, I was just starting off by thanking the African Futures uh, Institute for the kind invitation uh, to come and participate in this important discussion on uh, governance. And in actual fact, maybe before I start um, as respondent, let me uh, sort of paint a picture of our understanding uh, of what governance really means as Good Governance Africa. At Good Governance Africa, we, we, we really believe that um, governance, put simply, in a nutshell, is about who gets what, when, and how. It's really about the authoritative allocation of resources, and it is that process around the authoritative allocation of resources that brings us into this conversation. In actual fact, when uh, Yaki was um, presenting his fantastic uh, contribution into what governance is, he, 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 he called on me maybe to reflect a little bit more on this tension between uh, the challenge of inclusive governance and maybe creating more efficiencies um, in the governance uh, process what he describes as, as, as capacity. And I'll come back to that. However, at, at Good Governance Africa, our, our focus is really not just around um, the, the process of creating enhanced inclusivity within the governance process within the state, but it's also uh, really focused on the citizen. We try to establish whether process, processes and systems of governance um, enhance transparency and enhance accountability of the state. As we talk of the state, uh, what was particularly appealing uh, from uh, Professor Salir's contribution is the historical characterization of the state in and of itself. Uh, Yaki painted a, a, a very solid picture of the evolution of the state, the Westphalian state i.e. the establishment of security that is through a monopoly of violence, as uh, Tilly uh, spoke about, and then the establishment of capacity, and then higher order rights, um, which are characterized as democracy, human rights, and inclusion. Now, the, the, the interesting thing, and may, maybe where we um, slightly depart uh, between ourselves, that is the African Future Center and Good Governance Africa, is exactly around what the prospects or rather what the challenge of the simultaneity of development, which requires the post-Cold War African state to both establish inclusivity and at the same time security means. For Yaki, in, in my understanding, he says that um, it, it means that calls for uh, high levels of inclusion necessarily, necessarily lead to sort of less stable um, societies or less stable states. This is because of a lack of capacity. I want to maybe introduce something into this debate around you know, the post-colonial state, Yaki. And this is really around the issue of the presence of a strong private sector, which we do not add in, 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 in terms of our understanding of how the state has developed in uh, the post-colony in Africa. My argument here is that very often the, the private sector who often have greater capacity, especially in economic and other means, uh, are almost let off scot-free. At Good Governance Africa, we say that one of the essential um, characteristics of good governance is the ability of the state to create an enabling environment for the private sector to act as partners for development. Because ultimately, unlike the Westphalian state, and maybe the progression of the state in, in, in Europe, uh, especially when you look at capacity, creating a capable state that is able to uh, generate the jobs, create the enabling environment for 
uh, let's say, heightened economic activity, the African state has interestingly positioned itself as a retardant for the participation of the private sector and ultimately also has not created an enabling environment for uh, the private sector to act as good corporate citizens. That is good corporate governance. And what do I mean by that? We believe that in a modern African state, the private sector must act in ways that deliver shared value. And what do I mean by shared value? Ultimately, we say that for the development of the state, for the development of, of citizens, and ultimately a process that enhances transparency and accountability, the private sector, as an important participant in the state, cannot abdicate its role, cannot act in ways that treats Africa as an exploitable hinterland. And in actual fact, it is in Africa where, especially in fragile jurisdictions that experience low levels of governance, where we call upon corporates to exercise the highest levels of good corporate governance. And this, in essence, allows the state not only to fill the gap around capacity, in certain instances, security, however, in economic terms, generate uh, the well-being for citizens in a way that mirrors good and effective governance. Now, the, the other thing that I want to raise here maybe is uh, from a historical perspective, which was slightly challenging for me, Yaki, is the understanding of, let's call it the state, uh, before coloniality. And this might under, uh, explain in a historical sense why Africa Barometer, even though uh, it, it demonstrates that indeed people uh, call for, for better economic uh, conditions. They call for a greater delivery uh, by the state. Uh, they want jobs, et cetera. At the same time, Africa Barometer indicates to us that, that there is agitation by citizens in Africa for greater inclusion, for respect of human rights. This is because fundamentally, the state, I would argue, prior to colonialization, showed high levels of inclusion through the concept of Ubuntu. This is that ultimately uh, the, 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 the idea of an elite state where, you know, in, in, in a Westphalian system was reflected through this feudalism. In Africa, I would argue that there were higher levels of inclusion higher levels of communal participation in the systems of governance. And that is why I would argue that maybe what we need to do is not necessarily identify the challenges of, of governance as emanating from the imposition, that is the external imposition of state foundations from a Westphalian system that was imposed on Africa. But maybe it's also because there was a disjuncture and a cutting off of an understanding of governance from an African uh, position. I, I know I've, I've spoken a lot, but as I, as I conclude, I also want to maybe challenge you to understand something else, that maybe it is uh, it, it, the, 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 the violence, the protest, the higher levels of protest action that we anticipate as a result of, uh, let's say, um, agitation for higher levels of inclusive governance in the African state is most likely to emerge not because of that agitation, but it's really because of political and economic elites attempts to marginalize and exclude and not uh, practice inclusive governance. So it's not because of the citizens' agitation that we're going to see higher levels of uh, uh, protest action and violence, but it is because of the repression that is uh, imposed by political elites who try to maintain uh, their dominant position with regards to who gets what, when and how. I'll stop there. 
great. Thank you, Chris. I could listen to you forever and I have so much, you know, to, to chat to you about. But I think in the interest of time, I've seen uh, amazing uh, questions coming up. Uh, decentralization is key for Africa's development. Uh, there are other comments that are coming up and we really want to get into that. So stay on, on, on the call. Stay um, uh, while we go quickly to our next discussant, and um, we uh, and to, I want to have the opportunity now of introducing um, the participants to our next discussant, which is Dr. Tim Scott. Uh, Tim is a research um, senior research associate at the research ICT Africa, where he leads um, on AI, misinformation, and democracy cluster of uh, projects that he works on. He's also a um, senior research associate of the University of Johannesburg Center for Social Change and an affiliate to the Center for Information Technology and Public Life. Uh, he is the author of, of a, a book that was um, published, his second book, Algorithms and the End of uh, Politics, uh, which was uh, released in February, 2021. And his third book released this year, March, is the political economies of uh, fortune and misfortune prospects for prosperity in our times? Um, in our times. So, with that, Chris, I uh, uh, sorry, Scott, I welcome you to the platform, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, also for your for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Pamela. Can you hear me? Yes, we perfect. Can. Perfect. Okay. Well, um, I'll be brief. Be recognizing that we have time and comments and all these things that we want to get to. Um, I've been fortunate enough to read Yaki's uh, presentation in uh, booklet form for the last couple of days, and I've had a chance to think and uh, and reflect upon it. I mean, to give you a bit of a characterization, he's done a wonderful job uh, himself of looking at. The, at, at what he's produced, but it's a tremendous effort to bring together economic history, political and social theory, as well as data science to try and give us a more comprehensive understanding about the scenarios in front of us for African governance. Or should we rather say Africans' governance, because I think it's very important to uh, talk about plurality here, and I'll come back to that. Um, by tone and tenor, um, he very much reminds me of Cicero, what I mean by that is you sort of feel that he's caught between you know, these two forces on the one hand, you know, trying to make peace between the optimates and the populares, between reactionary and revolutionary thought, because ultimately his main concern is about peacemaking. Stability is his fundamental core concept around and the lens by which he starts to analyze the African, la the African landscapes in front of him. And we can sort of see that in his own presentation. There are a number of sort of comments that I'll get to and a number of questions that I'll pose to him too, much like Chris, there'll be, there's some ways in which I, you know, have, that I organize my thoughts slightly differently. Um, I'm not going to get into the nitty-gritty of this because that's sort of more, you know, more for lunch and for coffees and things like that. But I think one of the things that's very important is to really understand that the state formation literature that Yaki draws upon has been a, there's been a revolution in that in that field of study in the last 10, 15 years. Not to sort of go on at length about it, but for the longest period, the idea of state formation was very much based around the English and the Frank and the French experience. In the last 20 or 30 years, we started to see uh, discussions and investigations from Eastern Europe, from other parts of Western Europe, Northern Europe, Southern Europe, and then also looking into the Americas and then from the Caribbean and the Americas where I do most of my research on the social formation, uh, state formation. And then we start to see, we've seen more work you know, going on in Africa and in India. And there's a plurality of pathways to the state and even different types of polities and the conditions. There's a lot of conditional work over here and Yaki sort of speaks to that. More of what I'm trying to say is that his is a fair characterization, but there are other characterizations that are equally valid of that same evidentiary base. And I think that that's sort of something to keep in mind. The one thing that is very absent from his work, though, is a discussion about market integration. This is a theme that we, will, that we can come back to several times. Questions of money, of finance, of capital. There's a little bit of tax formation stuff over there, granted, but the, the role of capital, the role of labor, the, the, the antinomies between these two, the market formation, how tr the, he speaks about you know, enslavement and the tra and a little bit of the transatlantic, the black Atlantic experience, but there's that type of market formation that Africa has been vital uh, and participated in for 500, 600 years, 
is very much missing. I think that color is a little bit about the analysis today about market and market formation. I think that if we added that lens to it, we might come into, we might have something valuable to think about the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and how vital market integration may mean for stability, so on and so forth, providing incentives for peacemaking and you know so on and so forth. There's another element over here around the word democracy. And I find that Yaki has used democracy almost as a lump, that there's a lot of things that are lumped into it. Um, and so I think democracy comes to stand for simply more than the thick or thin versions that he alludes to in the writing, but sort of more an entire system of participation within the world. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but I think what that does is it sometimes misdiagnoses the problems when it comes to democracy. I think too often we think about democracy and we forget about capitalism. And so we attribute all the ills of capitalism to democracy. And I think that analytical distinction is very, very important when we come to understand why the democratic experience has sometimes been faulted or uneven on the African continent. Um, I want to talk a little bit more, and again, recognizing this sort of time over here, around uh, development and about degrowth. One of the difficulties that we face at the moment, and this is very much absent from the report, and it's something I'd like to see maybe moving forward, is the climate emergency and how carbon budgets are very much going to constrain growth potentials and how to think about creating economic opportunity, economic livelihoods, ways of living, and transactions that aren't dependent upon carbon. I think there's a significant area of research to think about how much of African economies or the ideas of African modernization, if we were to think about this in a sequential sense, is predicated upon carbon budgets. So that's something I'd like uh, maybe a sort of a quick response to. And there's sort of a very sort of minor thing over here. Now maybe this is where I'll wrap up. I'll wrap up with his words. The, the best thing I found about, to sum up his, his work, is on page 12 of this, of this report, and that is the African state is clearly not really uh, in control oftentimes because it was never really established and consolidated in the first place. And so I think that's a very important point. And that leads to what other types of political experimentation does Yaki maybe encourage us to think about? If this, if this polity isn't working in his mind, if, if there are rural land rebellions that are labeled as terrorism because the state just simply cannot exercise authority and provide services in these rural regions, if that simply cannot take place, are there other ways of organizing politically to having political structure that might be more useful? In short, is this maybe time for Africans in their sheer plurality to start experimenting with other types of political organization? I'm going to pause over there and uh, hand the floor back to you, Pamela. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Scott. I really like the way you, you, you interrogated. And before um, we move to the discussions, there's a... Uh, uh, Magusa, I see your hand. We will get to you shortly. But I want to allow Jackie the opportunity to please respond to the very um, brilliant comments made now by Scott, also some comments made by Chris, and then we can move into the Q&A very quickly. So Jackie, over to you. <clears throat> thanks, Pamela, and thanks both to Chris and to Scott. Brilliant uh, responses, great stuff. Um, and I'll just make a few comments about that. I, I really like the, the perspectives that you bring. I think the, the first two, just to make a few points with regard to the po points that uh, that Chris makes. I think, Chris, the, um, you have to, uh, we have to ask the question about the nature of the private sector. The private sector in South Africa is very different to the private sector in low income countries. And um, uh, whereas in, in, in low and low middle income countries, the, the when you speak of the private sector, I see multinationals. I don't see the kind of substantive, domestically grown private sector that can perform the role that uh, that you would like them to play. But you are right with regard to uh, the importance of the private sector in your seven upper middle income countries in Africa, um, uh, and 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 that is um, an area that we are increasingly also doing uh, doing work on. But um, I would caution against this um, the the idea of African exceptionalism around Ubuntu and so on and so forth. I, I personally, I'm a modernization scholar. I don't believe in African exceptionalism. I think that often um, the ideas of uh, lower levels of conflict, 
uh, Ubuntu actually reflects a more traditionalist society and uh, that all societies went through that process and um, as societies modernize, um, they become more hierarchical, the role definition uh, increases. That just never happened in Africa. It's a, in my view, therefore, a modernization challenge rather than an exceptionalist challenge uh, that uh, somehow Africa, Africa is different. I don't, I actually don't think Africa is, is that different uh, in many senses. Um, so that just uh, with regard to, and, and Scott also thanks very much uh, for your, uh, for your comments. I think, um, and by the way, the, um, if anybody wants the document that Scott referred to, what you do is you just go onto the theme and you press PDF, you have to register, which is free, and, and you download the whole report. Of course, there, there's a space problem. The original section on governance was very long and we had to chop it down uh, to deal with, uh, and it originally dealt with many of the issues that you, that you refer to. Um, but I would argue, uh, so, um, um, you know, our view, and I think that this holds globally, is that stability is foundational uh, to um, a society um, managing itself and growing, um, and particularly in an era of um, financial capitalism and uh, uh, globalization and uh, and and so on. If 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 Africa wants foreign direct investment, and we I've written extensively on this, and Africa um, does not attract sig significant um, uh, uh, foreign direct investment, it needs to change the way that it is perceived. It needs to be part of the African continental free trade area. And there's a whole theme on the website on the continental free trade area, which you wouldn't have seen if you just looked at the governance. And there's a whole theme on inward financial flows, where we look at if foreign direct investment, aid, remittances, and um, illicit financial outflows. So um, part, uh, I think, part of my response is that um, we're looking at governance, but uh, all the other areas uh, are also there. So sections with regard to, um, uh, it's just a question of, of space and time. And there is also, um, Scott, a whole theme on uh, uh, climate change and the, and the energy transition that actually we are updating at the moment. I think what, what uh, and finally, uh, we're embarking, hopefully with some involvement from Chris and Good Governance Africa on uh, fine tuning and interrogating our work on governance. And um, that exact question that you ask, I think is a very interesting one. Where is governance going in Africa? Where you have uh, weak states that are retreating to urban areas, ungoverned borderlands um, that are increasingly not under state control. And even in a country like South Africa, you see the, uh, the withdrawal of uh, traditional governance to urban areas because the rural areas of South Africa to a degree are becoming not, not they're just not governed by the state anymore. If you look at the decay and the collapse in, in certain areas, but these are hugely interesting issues that, uh, that I think we need to interrogate going forward. So just thanks Pamela for giving me the opportunity just to, to respond to, I think excellent comments and, and feedback. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, before we go on to the questions, uh, Mergasa, uh, can you please pose your question or your comment? I have um, unmuted you, please go ahead. Uh, you're on mute. You're on mute. Please unmute yourself. Linda, while you help us with that, I'm going to pose the question and then we'll give um, uh, Magasa an opportunity to um, make an intervention. Uh, there's one question in under a month and I, and I was I was really um, you know looking forward to this question regarding the coops now in the Sahel region and what's going on because not you know there's a misperception of what's going on there now there's a lot that we've heard of of Russia and Ukraine but everything seems to be you know very quiet in, in terms of what's going on in the Sahel so the question is in under a month there there were two coups in Africa and a third uh, year period uh, that seen a general surge. N Niger had uh, some immune in its neighborhood for years, and Gabon that has no history of coups. How do we qualitatively connect this wave 
of military takeovers with the state of misgovernance. So I, I, would, I pose that question to any one of you three, and um, maybe Jackie, you want to attempt that before we hear from Chris and Scott. <laughs> Yeah, um, Pamela, again, uh, we've done quite a bit of work on what's happened on the continent. So I, um, what we see today is the culmination of a series of successive shocks on Africa. They started with the 2007-2008 financial crisis, COVID, um, the Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and the impact of that on global tensions, reduced global governance, uh, uh, reduced uh, um, financial uh, government uh, revenues in Africa, and we modeled that in actual fact. And um, those three events, and there are many more, um, have provided an external shock uh, to Africa, which means that governments have less revenues to invest in education, in health, and in security. There are less jobs, there's more poverty, and people are more frustrated. If you combine that with a uh, Africa's youth bulge, which is both a potential and a negative, and um, a more educated population with less prospects than previously, the whole issue of relative deprivation, then Africa is becoming more unstable unless we can, uh, you know, our forecast of average growth rates of Africa is about 4.6% over the next two decades. That is hugely inadequate for a population that is growing, I think at about 2.1%. Uh, GDP per capita is just simply not growing. Africa needs to grow at like 10, 12, 13, 14 percent if it is to absorb um, the huge numbers of young Africans that are uh, that are coming uh, into the labor market. So I'm, I think that there are many, many challenges that, that lie ahead, but underpinning um, the there are the structural factors that underpin uh, are very important. These uh, member uh, questions that I've raised of low growth, uh, relative deprivation, and so on and so forth. And we look at all of these things in different sections on the website. Uh, and that is feeding into a globally, increasingly global competitive scenario. Now, I made reference in my brief summary of the world history to the fact that um, uh, instability in Africa intensified in the run-up to the end of the Cold War, 1989. It was the most unstable period in Africa's history because, in, because competition between, uh, at that point, the US and, and the former Soviet Union pushed, uh, pushed conflict out into Africa. And um, it's not impossible that that can happen again if we look at the competition and the uh, competitive system that, and, the, and the, what's happening between the US and China at the moment. Um, so global events, and we have modeled this, there's a section on the website called Africa and the World, and I would recommend that you have a look at Africa and the World, where we model the impact of uh, global developments on Africa's development potential. And because our governance, in a sense, is so thin, global developments have quite an impact on, on Africa. Also because we are largely commodity exporters, because the prices of commodity, China's growth is, is tapering rapidly. That means the demand for Africa's commodities is going to fall. That means African governments are gonna earn less money. That means instability is going to increase. So there are some of the reasons, but of course there is something with regard to France in Africa that we can't uh, ignore. Um, there is a legacy issue there. And there is also the issue of, of course, of the, to a limited extent, but still it is there, the role of Wagner, because in a sense, what Russia has been doing is it's been taking its war against the West um, into Africa. That's exactly what happened during the Cold War. So all of these global developments have an impact on the continent. And uh, yeah, we need to put them, we need to put them squarely on the, uh, on the table. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie. Uh, Magisa, can you try to uh, speak now, if you are able to? Unmute your mic. Okay, so there's another question uh, while we wait again. And when you uh, are able to speak, please just go ahead when, when you are given the opportunity to. Um, there's a question quickly. It says, I don't think that the idea of imposition can justify itself the problem of bad governance, that is. Do you not see that we um, do not encourage enough of, of our people to observe and respect what our institutions say? Um, maybe, Chris, would you like to maybe touch on that regarding our institutions? Yes. 
Yes, it, it's it's an interesting thing. I think what Yaki also tried to point out here was that one of the issues that characterizes um, uh, especially states that maybe do not have good and effective governance is that exact point, a lack of institutional capacity goes back to the capacity issue. And ultimately, I would like to maybe, as, as I answer that question, present um, a, a different approach to it, to say that in, in many ways, um, a false dichotomy has been presented about uh, governance, that is good governance, that um, it, it doesn't just have to focus on uh, inclusion, that is the uh, aspect around democracy, human rights, uh, etc. But also, uh, this false dichotomy seems to present a, a situation where you cannot have inclusion, but you must simply focus on the effectiveness of governance, that is establishing capacity, establishing security, which are prerequisites, especially in the African state. Our argument at Good Governance Africa is very simply this, that it is both. We should not present this false dichotomy. It is a challenge around the simultaneity of development uh, that is faced by many African states. But what we are pushing for at Good Governance Africa is really that uh, uh, political, uh, that the, the body politic within the state must not just be preoccupied with establishing effective states that just deliver services and higher economic growth. But what we should be looking for in Africa is really both of these, inclusion and effectiveness uh, within uh, the process of governance. Great, thank you. Thank you, Chris. In, in other words, institutions, you know, that uh, resolves both social systems, beliefs, its norms, values across the range, but bearing in mind that, you know, we have to keep the human behavior, you know, uh, in, in check as well. Thank you for that. I'm not sure why we are unable to get Magisa to pose a question. She's had her hand up for a very long time, but there was a comment uh, about, you know, um, they say there was a comment on, on Jackie alluding to the West African um, situation. And, uh, you know, they wanted to know if, according to your data, where will the next coup be taking place? I think if we knew that answer, we would be <laughs> resolving a lot of problems. But um, what do you recommend uh, for Africa to depopular, um, uh, politicize um, militaries on the African continent? Um, well, <laughs> Pamela, can I respond to that? Because that's a great yes, question. Um, <laughs> yes. There is a chart, uh, I'm not going to show it now, um, but there's a chart where we look at um, Africa's, uh, one of the charts on the on the website, uh, where we look at, um, on the in the governance platform, where we look at uh, what is the percent of of um, deaths by armed conflict in Africa versus our population versus uh, government uh, defense expenditure? And what is and Africa is a high conflict burden, but our expenditure on security is very low. Very important. There is there was a time when people argued that Africa is spending um, so much on its militaries and and security. Um, that it should reduce it, to reduce that. Uh, the reality is that um, Africa spends uh, less than any other region um, on military. Having made that point, um, what Africa should be doing is it should be getting rid of its military and converting its military into gendarmerie type forces. Because we, what we've done in, in Africa, and my background is a security background, um, is that we have simply adopted the Westphalian model of armed forces in defense of an external attack. And what Africa has, all our security challenges are internal challenges. They are governance challenges. They are insecurity uh, challenges. It's not a defense against ex external attacks. So South Africa goes and buys Gripen aircraft, submarines, and all kinds of stuff, which it doesn't need. Who's gonna attack us? Botswana, Lesotho, it's crazy stuff. We should really be looking at um, uh, orientating our military and uh, to uh, their real tasks at hand. And those real tasks would be border security, internal support to the police, uh, participation uh, in uh, regional peacekeeping, and emergency response uh, sections. I've done a lot of work on in that area. But that is a very good example of where 
Africans are barking up the wrong tree. And there's no, no wonder the Nigerian military or whichever example you can't use, you want to use, can't respond uh, to Boko Haram or whichever the case may be, because they are preparing and equipping themselves for completely inappropriate uh, roles and missions. It's a big discussion that one can have separately. But of course, um, it does go back to the nature of governance, because what has happened, for example, in Gabon, well, you've had, an, you've had a, a family run this country for more than 50 years. It's a family business. You have cooked elections, and then the elections don't produce change. So when somebody then takes, well, somebody, if the military then intervene, then, um, but, but the elections are fraudulent. So there is no other means. I go back to the points that there are certain fundamentals of democracy, free elections that are absolutely critical to represent. If, if elections in Gabon were really free and fair and observed as such, we wouldn't have had a coup. So um, I, I think that there are certain other leaders um, in Africa that um, that have that are trying to establish a dynasty or have established a dynasty in Southern Africa and in East Africa that should be worried <laughs> because um, I think what is happening is that there's a rash uh, of, of coups and at the moment it's limited to Francophone Africa. I don't think it's going to stay limited to Francophone Africa because the example, the demonstration effect, I think is also going to affect um, um, uh, other other countries on the continent. I don't think we've seen the end of this yet. Thank you, Jackie. Um, I'm going to pose this comment or question to Scott, uh, seeing that you're an AI guy, and it says Africa's digitalization will put in place trust, transparency, accountability, good governance, and inclusiveness. Uh, put in place multilateral institutions, governance private sector, civil society, et cetera, at, at all the uh, levels, regional, sub, uh, regional, national level, and local levels. What are your thoughts about that, uh, um, uh, Scott? Because uh, this is just a comment, but I, I think it will be good to maybe just address that, uh, where they feel that digitalizing Africa might also resolve the transparency and accountability issue. Yes, great. Now, I'll, I'll be able to answer that both succinctly and at length. And the short answer is not a chance. The, we have this very sort of techno messiahistic idea that if we change a few instruments, we're going to get better outcomes. The problems aren't technological, they're sociological, they're anthropological. These are the things that Jackie, that Yaki is trying to talk about. These are matters of historical structures that you know have historical inertia. There's a path dependency that if you just simply add in a new te technological device, you know, you're not going to suddenly just wash away the um, the wash of history. You're not going to wash away history. So I think we need to be very circumspect about our thinking over here, because too often, you know, we already have AI hype from uh, Silicon Valley companies who are really simply doing. They're trying to increase the share price for their shareholders, and we need to be very circumspect about what they are trying to do and whether we take those talking points or not. So I think Africans being very well attuned to history should not be taking our talking points from Silicon Valley um, marketers, washing them and let, slapping the label Africa on top of it and saying, there we, there we go. I think we need to be much more, uh, much more intellectual with our thought and we need to be much more skeptical of the types of press releases that come our way. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Scott, for that. Uh, Jackie, you answered this question, but for the benefit of um, the others on the call, about, uh, you know, this presentation provided a great insight and practical uh, from a what perspective, but from a do perspective, from a how perspective, what as ISS Africa also, you know, being involved in, in terms of dialogues, et cetera. This platform is one of them, if I can say that. But Jackie, is there something else that you'd maybe want to respond to in terms of how ISS is taking some of the outcomes of this foresight into countries? Thanks, Pamela. I, I first want to just make a comment with regard to some of the issues that Chris raised. Um, and just to make the point that um, in my view, um, you can't get around the state. You can't get around the requirement to build an effective state that uh, provides the basic services. Certainly, 
Um, the private sector can deliver a lot, and with every passing year, its ability through modern technology to deliver more uh, increases. But uh, you need an effective, uh, you need, we need to fix government and governance in Africa. We can't get around that. Uh, because a greater role for the private sector means that you increase inequality uh, in, in a society. And, and that's been actually quite evident, for example, in, in South Africa. I just wanted to make, uh, make that remark because the IMF and the World Bank, um, during their structural adjustment programs, exactly tried to do that. They said the African state is, is corrupt, bad, useless. We're going to um, provide money to uh, civil society, to the private sector to develop Africa it actually accelerated Africa's problems and challenges more than anything else. We, we have to fix the state. Um, then um, uh, with regard to what we do now, the, I'm the AFI program, African Futures and Innovation Program is part of the broader Institute for Security Studies. And we spend most of our time, we have a public face uh, where we comment and, and, and publish a tremendous amount, but most of our work is in actual fact uh, trying to help governments, providing training, capacity building. But uh, the the issues that drive governance, and I've tried to um, to show that in, in our work, change slowly. Uh, government capacity is not something that you switch on and off. Um, it is something that is built up over time. And that um, a, a lot, given low levels of development, depends on, on leadership. If you don't have the institutions, upper middle income countries, high income countries uh, have institutions because uh, institutions cost money. Um, low income countries and low middle income countries, a lot depends on, on leadership. And if you are lucky enough to have a developmentally orientated governing elite, uh, that goes a long way. But if you don't have that, um, then, then, you, then you have problems. And that's what we have. Uh, in much of Africa, we because you don't have the state formation process, and I use the the parody of the Westphalian process to illustrate that. Um, then you have to do this in, as I was trying to present, in parallel, which is much more difficult, because your room for maneuver is constrained. Uh, in you know, 50 years ago, even 50 years ago. Uh, governments could do what they wanted to in, with regard to suppressing riots, uh, uh, insurgencies, and so on. Today, it's a different world. You can't do that. So it requires a different approach. Um, so that is a, is a complicated world. But one of the things that we are doing is working with NEPAD, um, uh, the African Futures and Innovation Program. We, uh, if you, you would have seen that on the site, there are um, forecast for every African state and working with NEPAD, uh, we are working to improve those forecasts. We, we train uh, government officials in the use of the forecasting platform and uh, encourage them to bring that into their own planning. And many African governments are trying to do that. In October, uh, together with uh, Pamela is hosting a big conference in Addis Ababa where we're bringing all the regional economic community uh, uh, technical people together, and we're going to train them on for, foresight, uh, use of foresight tools, because if you look at where you can go, it, it, it helps to take away the, the challenges of the differences that people have at the moment. If we can create a common vision, I think it is very powerful. Uh, and and there, I think our collaboration with NEPAD is, is one example. It's a small contribution of where we can make a bit of a difference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, before I end, there seems to be one last um, comment again. Uh, why there are many coups in Africa? Is it because African development is not holistic? Holistic development, social, economic, environment, development, gender, and human rights uh, promotion. But in Africa, social development is left behind with poverty increasing uh, trust, loss, violence, etc. Yeah, I think I think we have we have answered that in a, in a in a broad scale. Um, I want to give this opportunity uh, for Chris or for Scott to please um, you know communicate your your last uh, comments before we we end the session. Um, or and Jackie as well. Is there anything that you'd like to leave us with, Chris? Yes. First of all, I just want to really appreciate the excellent work that Yaki has done. Uh, it really forms an excellent basis for us who are interested 
in governance and the improvement and enhancement of governance in Africa uh, to both use empirical uh, tools to really prove the case around how good and effective governance is so important to the development of our, uh, our continent. As I say this, one of the things that that we at Good Governance really aim to do to uh, talk to the so what and, and the how question is that we uh, do applied policy research work ultimately to ensure that we can empower citizens to hold their governments to account, call for enhanced governance and effective uh, delivery of services, but also to establish institutions and systems that are more transparent. We also act in ways where we try to empower our governments to become more effective at the work of becoming good governors. So the work of Good Governance Africa is both focused on those who would govern and also on those who uh, are governed to ensure that there is parity with regards to what Yaki keeps on pointing out as this process of establishing and fixing the problem of the simultaneity of development in Africa. It's been a privilege being here and I'd like to uh, thank Yaki for his uh, constant support and uh, also to the ISS and also to the uh, African Futures uh, program. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, and all the best for the good governance space that you are working in. Thank you again. Uh, Scott, can I move to you for your last parting words and then we'll, we'll hear from Jackie at the end. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, again, thank you to the uh, to everyone for organizing this event. It's been very lovely and you know, be lovely to hear the the points raised by both Yaki and Chris. Um, I did want to say that uh, I thought that the tw that the thirty page brief uh, report that I read could really have been a three hundred page book. And so this sort of really sort of talks about the need to do this type of work. I am very appreciative of the ambition that the work has shown, and uh, I think it raises the bar. And so I compliment Yaki and his team for doing extraordinary efforts and. I think that this type of uh, work combined economic history, political and social theory, and data science is really the, the way forward. And I, I encourage and I encourage him to continue doing that and so that the rest of us may be able to follow. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Scott, and thank you for walking this path with us as well. Jackie, before you make your last uh, question, there's a I mean comment. There's a um, comment on the on the chat that you mentioned that uh, the future of Africa depends on democracy. Uh, but do you agree that sovereignty is more important than democracy? So I'm going to allow you to answer that while you give your, your last comments as well. You know, that's such a fundamental question. It is such a, a good question. Uh, it was posed by Benedict Musa Euro. Euro. Uh, it's, it's, it's an excellent, excellent remark because that's exactly where we are grappling with. Because in the past, historically, and this is in a sense the story that I tried to tell, sovereignty was absolute. And governments could do what they wanted to do. So they could establish the security foundation through the most brutal means, if you go back in history. Um, that has changed. Um, sovereignty is no longer uh, absolute. But what is interesting about the, today's world, particularly um, in the aftermath of the BRICS summit in South Africa, is that that is exactly the difference between how the West, rich countries, democracies view the world and um, and let's call it the global south views the world because for the west you gain legitimacy by how you treat your citizens or that's how they say their practices uh, a different issue but let's let's deal with what they say whereas for um, the global south china and others it is much more important how countries treat one another it's quite an important distinction um, and they, they, in a sense, how you govern yourself internally is um, neither here nor there. Um, so the end result is you have, um, uh, uh, and this is, of course, it's a function of history. Because of colonialism and imperialism, the experiences that China had, uh, that even um, that many countries in, in Asia had, and all African countries had about foreign interference, we have a, 
an allergic reaction against um, anybody who wants to tell us what we should do and how we should do it. But the reality is that the world is becoming interdependent. And um, my view, I, I say I'm a modernist, is that um, um, development inevitably creates a demand for greater self-actualization. So I think that the challenges are with China and with Russia. At some point, the Chinese, the Russians, and others, as they go up the GDP per capita curve, will also demand a greater say in their children's future and options about what they want to do. And that presents global challenges. Um, that is why a democracy like the United States has so much more absorptive power um, than an autocracy um, like uh, China and others. So this issue is fundamental. Um, we live in a world where uh, we can see what other countries do to their citizens. And we all desire, particularly as, we, as our living standards improve, we, we desire self-actualization. We want the ability to determine our future and our children's future, and we don't want uh, yeah, we want that space. And uh, that is one of the challenges that we face. And one of the challenges that Africa faces, because we have this massively growing population, and you can buy the demands of your population off if you grow rapidly enough. If you are the Middle East, you've got oil, or you are China, and you've got a manufacturing uh, leadership and a manufacturing transition. But if you, if you stop growing, and this is what's been happening in Africa, and why I uh, if you do not grow uh, and improve your the the, uh, the uh, citizens' jobs and opportunities, then you run into problems, and um, uh, that's in a sense what what uh, this coup belt and Africa's problems are are about. If Africa was growing at 10, 12 percent per year, um, it wouldn't have the problems that it has now. But if growth plummets, instability increases. It's uh, unfortunately one of those things. But Pamela, thank you very much. Uh, for, for chairing this. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. I, I don't want to do injustice. I know we have gone over time, but in a few minutes we'll close. Uh, Patrice Young has the hand raised. We lost one, but I think, Patrice, let me give you an opportunity to pose your comment, please. I know that you're not mute you are muted it's showing me that you are muted there you go please go ahead hello thank you very much uh, moderator and thanks to all the panelists i just want to give a contribution a proposal looking at all the shortcomings from the various presentations i think for africa to come out of this situation uh, we should be able to propose to the African state to introduce good governance, transparency, human rights in the full curriculum from primary, elementary, uh, secondary, high to the higher level, so that it will be already laid the foundation for the future generation. Because to me, upon all our exchange brainstorming, as an African, simply realize that we Africans, we need to change our mentality. So long as the mentality doesn't change, no matter what you give us, no matter what you do, there will be no headway. One of the key things is uh, education. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patrice. I couldn't agree with you more. I always stand by the fact that a knowledgeable um, you know, population is a peaceful one. So I, I really, really couldn't agree with you more. And I think I had this conversation with Jack, Jackie many, many years ago about taking this into as a curriculum into the schools. So Jackie, we will, we will pick that conversation up again. And I just want to um, really thank you all Participants, we really could not have come, uh, you know, seven weeks of doing this series without your support and your participation. And really, I look forward to for you joining us next week on our session on illicit financial flows. It also will prove to be very uh, interesting and engaging. Uh, and watch the space, please, for the upcoming um, uh, think tank conference that we will hold in Addis Ababa on the 
uh, 3rd to the 5th of October. I want to use this opportunity again to thank the ISS team, the AUDA and NEPAD team, and to our discussants today, Chris and Scott, thank you so much for, for your intervention, for your time. Jackie, for your excellent presentation and always insightful. I never get tired of of all the you know um, different scenarios that you model. So thank you for that. And we are most grateful from the members of the ISS Partnership Forum, the Hans Naden Foundation, the European Union, the Open Society Foundations, and the governments of Denmark, Ireland, and Netherlands, Norway, as well as Sweden for making this possible. If you can please spend a few minutes, we have a poll that's coming up shortly on the screen. This poll is just to ask you know, the participants to help us improve our, our sessions. And uh, we look forward to seeing you and we wish you a wonderful and a, a, a restful weekend. So thank you for your time and have a good day further. Thank you.